It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, Conservative peer and Times columnist Danny Finkelstein, the Labour MP and author John Cruddus, the Independent peer Claire Fox and the co-leader of the Scottish Greens, Lorna Slater. Today is Slees Back. There should be a transparent, independent inquiry into the increasing sleaze that's going on in government. The government voted that down and blocked it. It has not been clear where the boundaries lay. In fact, I hope this doesn't sound rude. There doesn't seem to be any boundaries at all. Did the rot start with the former Prime Minister? We'll ask this ally of David Cameron. Also today, was this the moment Labour detached itself from the working class? This changing world is indifferent to tradition, unforgiving of frailty, no respecter of past reputations, Let's start with the story that is dominating politics. It began with the former Prime Minister uh, David Cameron and his lobbying of ministers on behalf of financial firm Greensill Capital. It's now gone beyond that. It's rippling through Whitehall. There are now concerns both about lobbying and also the revolving door between government and private companies. Let me just show uh, the panel and our viewers the front page here of the Metro. It says in inverted commas, sleaze is bad. So my opening question to the panel is, do you agree with Labour's charge? Presumably you do, John Cruddus. I do. And when I read and listen to this, I literally have my head in my hands. The story is disastrous for politics. It poisons the well and breeds further distrust. And my constituents are really struggling in terms of jobs, housing. They're just getting by and coming out of this pandemic. And we as a country have to demand more of our government. And there has to be better than this. And our past prime ministers have to be behave better than this. Um, and I fear this will continue to fester for many months, given the number of inquiries that are out now. And I worry that Boris Johnson won't want to necessarily reform the system because there's an assumption that there's these sweetheart deals that are a dividend for holding office. And we're no longer talking about sacrifice, just about filling our boots down the road. So I've been around the track a few times and I'm not prone to hyperventilate, but I think this is a big political crisis coming. All right. And we're going to get into the detail of that uh, through this programme. Uh, Claire, do you agree with Labour's charge? I'm not entirely sure that I ever thought it went away. A, a broader question for me is I don't want a world in which lobbying is not allowed. I don't think that would be the right outcome of an inquiry because it's very important that politicians, elected politicians, talk to other people other than themselves or their civil servants. So in the midst of this, baby and bathwater spring to mind. And also, since I've been in the Lords, lobbying goes far beyond, um, you know, corporates. Mm. And, I, you know, if you think about it, trade unions lobby, charities lobby and endlessly being sent information by different NGOs. So we shouldn't just look at business in this and just see that as sleaze, but what kind of influence and how external organisations have. Lorna, is sleaze back? I, I agree that I don't think it ever went away. And I think that there is a massive difference between the kind of lobbying we see from charities, for example, the ones that bombard me with e concerned emails, and the kind of lobbying that involves money, exotic trips, uh, off the record meetings at luxury restaurants. You know, I work for a private company and as an employee, I have to sign a non-bribery agreement with the company, which means that you know I can't go out to dinner with a certain supplier. I can't show that kind of preference. If we can do this in private business, we should expect at least the same kind of commitment and transparency from our politicians. OK, we're going to try and unpick some of the issues that you've all raised. Danny, um, I'm ending the opening question with you because you are a friend, a colleague of David Cameron's. You were for uh, many years. Do you think that rightly or wrongly he will be seen as a prime minister who brought back what many do see as sleaze? Well, first of all, 
because I'm a friend of his, because I'm someone who admires him and who shares a lot of his politics. I'm not the best independent judge of that, to be honest. Um, but I think it's clear that it will be part of the record on David Cameron, just because it's become a huge story. I want to address the point that's been made more broadly, though, about whether Sleazy's is back and how sleazy this country is. I don't believe this is a sleazy country. Uh, I think that there are always, in any country, going to be questions about the propriety of different individual acts and about the practice. Practices. So, for example, about the ability of people to leave the civil service or government after only two years work for companies. Is that long enough? Is it being enforced strongly enough? Because it's quite clear that it hasn't been. There are always going to be questions of that mm. kind, and we have to answer those. Do I believe that this is fundamentally a sleazy country? Do I believe that um, the country is corrupt? Absolutely, I do not believe that. All right, well, that... And, and I, and, and I think that um, we need to be able to distinguish between thinking that we've got always improvements to make, believing that this has been demonstrated by some of the things that worry people about this particular incident, and thinking that as a result we live in a uh, in a sleazy country because I don't think we do. Right. I mean, uh, you've made it very clear that those are your thoughts on the country. I'm going to pull you back to David Cameron because, as I said, it began with David Cameron, a former yes. prime minister. Um, do you think that his reputation is being deliberately or unfairly tarnished? No, I think he made a mistake. I think he made two mistakes, actually. The first is that he thought Greensill would be a more robust company than it was. He therefore extolled the virtues of an organisation that clearly didn't have the virtues he thought it had. I think that was a mistake. He knows I think that, and I've written it and said it publicly. And the second mistake, which he's acknowledged himself was, it was a mistake to conduct lobbying in the way that he did, uh, because he was doing doing it in an organisation in which he had a financial interest. And there's a difference when you do it in that way. And probably, uh, you know, there ought to be rules probably governing how long a prime minister has to wait before they did it. But both of those things were mistakes. They will definitely be part of the account on David Cameron. All of us will differ about how important we think that is, depending on what we thought before about David Cameron. Personally, I regard him as a person of integrity and ability, and I share a lot of his political views yeah. and retain a strongly positive view of him. But I don't deny, because that would be silly, uh, that this incident, he made mistakes, and they're ones that he's being called out on. Right. I mean, I don't know if you've spoken to him um, since this whole saga actually began, but do you think he feels that there is an unfair focus on him rather than also on current government ministers? I have spoken to him, but I can't speak for him. Um, it wasn't my impression that he thought that it was unfair. Um, uh, I don't think that's the way he thinks. I think he does acknowledge that uh, there were mistakes, and he does also believe that uh, it demonstrates that merely keeping by the rules, which was something that also came out in the expenses scandal, actually, uh, isn't necessarily uh, a total defence. Um, I'm, so I'm speaking for myself rather than him in saying, mm. look, we have a we have a, sit a situation in which in which somebody lobbied the government and the government didn't do anything. Uh, we haven't actually in this great sleaze scandal put our finger on any way in which the public has actually lost out as a result of any of these activities. That doesn't mean that the activities were good, but it means that our ways of preventing them from turning into scandals okay. remain relatively robust. It doesn't mean we shouldn't visit them, revisit them, uh, but it means that simply sweepingly say this is a sleazy country is an exaggeration. Well, it's not going to be uh, swept under the carpet, certainly by the number of committees that are ongoing. Um, David Cameron and Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, have agreed or certainly reported to have agreed that they will give evidence on Greensill um, as Labour uh, is obviously attacking them for that specifically. Um, but I just want to refer our viewers to a tweet from my colleague Adam Fleming, BBC political correspondent, who now says that there are six inquiries, reviews or probes into lobbying and Greensill. You can see it here. One of them is the case review of civil service double jobbing. This was the news, you may remember, yesterday of Bill Crothers, who was an extremely important civil servant because he was in charge of all the commercial contracts within Whitehall and the revelation that he also had a job, a part-time job, working for Greensill, so in the private sector too. Uh, and the top civil servant, now Simon Case, has written to permanent secretaries throughout Whitehall demanding to know if anyone else is doing something similar. He had a 5pm 
uh, deadline yesterday. No doubt we'll find out what he has been sent. There's also the Public Administration Committee. There's going to be a Treasury Committee looking into this standards in public life. It says number five is Boardman. That's Nigel Boardman, who's been tasked by the government to look into this and a Cabinet Office Review of Lobbying Act. So there is plenty going on in terms of questions being asked. But I want to come back to you, John. There is an implication that is this about a few individuals, because the rules are there in place and people will say David Cameron didn't break the rules. Is this about a few individuals or is it a systemic problem? The jury's out on that, actually, because, I mean, it, it aligns with some of the concerns that have been raised about the contract culture at the centre of government, the sense that there is a revolving door on uh, the government and certain corporate elites linked in with patterns of friendship, so-called chumocracy. Mm. Um, but twas ever thus, to be wasn't it, John? That was well, I'm sure it was ever thus, but there has been a sort of... There's been a... There's been a backup of cases over the last few months that has main, made sure that this is back into the mainstream of our political discussion. I don't think the public have really zoned in on this yet. Mm. And that's your point about these six inquiries being that this will fester for months now and all sorts of stuff will come out. And it does look like there are people tipping this out from the centre of government. So the, the, I, if I was in government, I would be very worried about this because this has got a really combustible feel to it. Right. Uh, Laura, you were shaking your head when I said, is it down to a few individuals? Um, you think it's systemic, presumably? Yeah. This, the idea that you can spin this as, oh, just it's a one-off. David Cameron's a guy. He just made a mistake and not a systemic problem. I remember reading articles years ago about exactly this sort of corruption, the revolving door, how people who make the tax law then go work for tax firms to show companies and wealthy individuals how to dodge the taxes. This has been going on for a very long time. And I have to tell you that I don't think it is a dodgy country. I, but I do think it's a dodgy government. And sitting in Scotland, mm. looking at Westminster, it looks very corrupt. Oh, right. And, and are you saying that you, you, you would never find any sort of revolving door in Scotland or Scottish politics? That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying, we have stricter rules on lobbying in the Scottish Parliament, and they could probably be made stricter. But as someone who's in favour of Scottish independence, seeing Westminster corruption, seeing PPE contracts handed out to pals of the government not based on whether they had competence to deliver. You know, that was the whole fairy companies with no fairies. Mm. It looks like an incompetent and corrupt government. And I have to tell you, it's doing a lot for Scottish independence. Right. Claire? Well, in view of the fact that the uh, SNP run Scotland at the moment are advocating for Scottish independence and have just been involved in a huge constitutional scandal, it reminds me that one of the problems with a debate that focuses inside, entirely on sleeves, which everybody gets very agitated about, even though, as far as I'm concerned, there was as much democracy in all of the mainstream political parties, not just the Tories. I don't like the whiff of this even remotely, but I'm just worried that with six inquiries, we might forget the priorities that the country faces at the moment. There are huge questions to be asked about democratic accountability, particularly in relation to the pandemic, the acquired, the powers that the state has acquired at the expense of individuals in this country. And I just don't want to get overly distracted. I, I, you know, this needs to be looked at fine, but bearing in mind that David Cameron brought in a lobbying bill, I remember at the time making the point then that I thought that institutional capture by political interest groups was something that might be one should be concerned about, but that lobbying, i.e. the art, the important contribution of outside forces to politics being allowed to talk to ministers yes. should not be forgotten. And no, so it just me... shows me that you can make a fuss, mm. have a bill, pass laws, have rules, yeah. and we still end up in the same place. It can be a distraction. Right. There's an awful lot to, to, to pick up. Uh, Danny, on that final point of Claire's, this was also something that uh, Sir David Normington, uh, former permanent secretary at the Home Office, said, that there are rules. It's just that people aren't behaving and adhering or they're testing them to the limit. Do you think the rules do... I think you did say at the beginning the rules do need to be changed in order to stop people um, somehow finding a way around them? Look, I'm really happy to live in a country in which we regard this as a major scandal um, because it's right, actually, to be concerned about everything that's been raised. And we ought to check what the impact was on the public good. We ought to make sure the rules are there, that they are, are able to be enforced before the country be does become seriously corrupt. And actually, by the way, one of the things that has been raised has been PPE. I think when we abandon the rules during, uh, that does deserve quite close inquiry. And that is, I think, much more serious because lots of 
very large quantities of public money was involved. And, and it's particularly important when governments have been in power for a long time. Mm. The political importance of this is that time for a change is by far the biggest challenge that the Conservative Party will face at the next general election. And this is part of time for a change feeling without any question. So I think that um, what the rules are, how they're being enforced, it's right to inquire into this. I'm, I'm very pleased that the um, that this has sparked off this level of anxiety. It's correct that we ought to have zero tolerance to it, but we should not move from that to the assumption, which is mainly rhetorical, um, that uh, this is a, that this is a sleazy country or a corrupt government. If you start to use that phrase, um, you don't have any intensifiers left for actual corruption. Um, and, uh, right. you know, when you are trying to distinguish between what happened in PPE on PPE, which may be quite bad, mm -hmm. and what happened on in green on green sill, uh, which where money may not actually have changed hands at all, uh, you don't have any ability to distinguish between them. Anymore. Right. But isn't that where Labour's heading, John? That's the strategy, isn't it? Um, well, I, I think we will be hammering in on this because it also it also plays into the whole legacy of David Cameron in the last 10 years. There's a, there was a really interesting uh, leader in the New Statesman thing today, which talked about the Cameron legacy and considered these charges of sleaze in the context of a decade of austerity, which paying for the bank bailout on the backs of the poor, a botched NHS reorganisation, doomed EU renegotiation, a delusionary golden age with China. All of this is coming into play, I think, to, to really sort of rethink the last decade. And that is dangerous for the Tories because that time for change gambit pushed by Labour at the next election will have more potency because of these last few days. And this is just the start of this crisis. Danny? Yeah, I think that's... I mean, that's what I would do if I were in your position as well. I would also um, make sure that everyone thought it was important as uh, I could possibly make them think it was. And I think you might be successful in that. I do think the gov governments are very vulnerable after they've been to a time for a change feeling. And this will be, without any question, part of it. And by the way, the underlying experience may actually be of the economy. Uh, it may be that we have a very difficult economy and the expression of it actually may be sleaze. And, I, you know, you're asking me because of my links with David Cameron, but actually working for John Major really persuaded me of that. Right, I John? think that um, it's very, very powerful, yes. John? Yes, I, I agree with that. I mean, I also think there are bigger issues here for the public when they start thinking how much do very rich people actually want in terms of the money they need to live when their people are struggling. And that juxtaposition between how we seem to be behaving in Westminster, our leadership versus the struggles we're experiencing day to day in this epic pandemic is really dangerous for or the incumbent government. Right. You mentioned, I think, John, uh, a little earlier, uh, whether this is having some sort of cut through uh, with the public. Well, uh, rather helpfully, there has been a YouGov poll. How closely is the public following the David Cameron Greensill capital story? Um, and only 4% of people so far at the moment are following it very closely. A fifth of people are following it. Uh, sorry, 4% are following it very closely. A fifth of people are following it fairly closely, but 28% of people aren't following the story at all. I hope you followed that, uh, panellists. Um, so, listening to that, Claire, what does that tell you? Well, I, I suppose it's what I was trying to hint at, which is that, I mean, I don't disagree with what John says about the fact that the everyday lives of ordinary people, millions of us, you know, the whole country, in relation to the pandemic has been pretty grim. But when I'm talking to people and what I'm picking up is it just feels to me as though this is in danger of being something which Westminster are overly preoccupied about, where, where people have scandalised or things like what's happening in care homes, the fact that you have to be in isolation for two weeks, just been announced it, if you're new to a care home. You know, all these kind of things about the lack of jobs, the fear of what will happen after furlough. So where I think John is right, is in the context of the fact that lockdown's dragging on, that the economy is not being sparked into action anytime soon, and that people are facing real immiseration and also feeling what it feels like to have no power, no freedom, then obviously the idea of a sleazy political elite, you know, has a kind of popular resonance. But I don't think the particulars of this have captured the imagination yet. And I'm just worried about an opportunism amongst you know, opposition uh, politicians using this to bash the Tories when actually what we need is a political elite that seriously looks at 
kick-starting society after lockdown because that's what really faces all of us. And it would be a tragedy if we got overly caught up in the ins and outs okay. of just this. All right, we're going to have to move on um, and talk about something different. In this year's Tees Valley mayoral election, only a Conservative and Labour candidate are on the ballot. So what could the result tell us about the Tories' chances of maintaining support in the region? And Keir Starmer's hopes for a Labour recovery. Here's Greg Dawson. Tees Valley to me means community. It means people surviving through the worst hard times, but we thrive. There is a shared history of industry. There's a shared history of the people. There seems to be a lot more happening. The Tees Valley is a region famed for its pride and resilience, and in recent years, home to one of the UK's more unexpected political battlegrounds. When voters chose a Conservative mayor in 2017, it foreshadowed Labour's disastrous 2019 election, losing voters in its northern industrial heartlands. Keir Starmer has come along and, you know, maybe he'll, he'll be a force for change for the Labour Party. But from what I've seen, I think that's a bit of a slow burn at the moment. And I think the Conservative Party have just, um, they've just done a lot more for the area. Jasmine Robson owns her own small business in Darlington. She's a former Labour voter, but has been impressed with the Conservatives' vision of investment in towns like hers. The more businesses, the more people in the town, the better for people like me who've got a coffee shop or a bar, um, the independent shops in the town. In a sign of Boris Johnson's determination to keep new voters on side, Teesside was a big winner in March's budget, with more than 40 million promised to towns here, a free port which offers tax breaks to any companies working in the area, and this the planned site for the Treasury's new northern campus in Darlington, with a promise of 750 civil service jobs to the region. Right opposite the site is the UK's new centre of excellence for bioscience. Its director says despite the pandemic, there's optimism in the region. The snowball effect at the moment, we seem to be getting lots of great news for the area, whether it's the Novavax vaccine or whether it's the Treasury of the North or the invest investment in um, hydrogen and, and net zero carbon. So I think it's definitely an area to watch in the UK. And I think with the Treasury coming, there will definitely be opportunities for local people to, to kind of work there and, and stay here if they want to. But for some, the promise of jobs tomorrow isn't enough. As far as I can say with the mayoral elections uh, is, you know, it's all right being focused on infrastructure. Let's deal with the poverty at the bottom first. So I'm delivering the in Saltburn by the Sea, Tonya Nixon's charity helping Teesside's most deprived has never been busier. I don't think we've ever seen people going hungry like we have with COVID. Red Cairn, Cleveland and Tees Valley is, you know, is a poor region because of everything. You know, we've got ghost towns. The Tees Community Hub offers free furniture and clothes to those who need it most. And during the last 12 months, they also provided Meals on Wheels. You know, why have we had to wait for COVID to hit before we've realised the poverty? That's always been there. It isn't new. COVID didn't make it new. It made it more in your face. The government's own measurements for deprivation show several areas of the Tees Valley, including Darlington, Stockton, Middlesbrough, Redcar and Cleveland, all worse off than they were in 2015. So what was the mayor's response when we caught up with him? I'm not shying away from the fact that we haven't had investment in this area for decades. You can't change that overnight and tinkering around the edges is not going to do anything. By creating these big employers, by bringing these big game-changing investments to Teesside, whether it's the Freeport, Treasury and other things, you really create a step change in the economy. And if you want to get people out of poverty, you create jobs. The woman hoping to beat Ben Houch in next month is Labour candidate Jessie Jo Jacobs. Hello. And in a sign of the time, she had to speak to us from her home because she was self-isolating. People are desperate for hope. They're desperate for change. There is not one indicator for the Tees Valley that in four years of a Tory mayor has, has, got, be has got better. For me, the, it's about a, a green port or a free port, so ensuring that there's workers' rights and protections there. So we get great jobs with great salaries and great conditions. If she wins, she's also promising a fund to regenerate the high streets across the region. We met Nick on a walk with Watson here. He lives just outside Saltburn. Train stops here. Public transport is absolutely dreadful. But there's people up there that can't get out of their village. It takes an hour and a half on the bus to get to Middlesbrough. He's a Labour supporter but wasn't impressed with the party's tone under Jeremy Corbyn. But he rejoined when Keir Starmer was elected. 
it's okay shouting on social media, but you need to be involved. You need to speak to people, try and change minds. Rejoining something that didn't seem so silly and, and that wasn't just ridiculous, shouty, left-wing politics. I am, I am left-wing, I am a socialist, but that isn't the way to win. Keir Starmer has already played down Labour's chances of making significant gains in next month's elections, but whether he likes it or not, the result here will be seen by many as an early judgment on his first year in the job. Greg Dawson reporting. John, listening to that no doubt raises concerns in your mind about Labour's strategy. Do you think the party can win back areas like the Tees Valley, which were once traditional Labour heartlands? Well, that's the big question that I try to confront in the book that's coming out tomorrow. I mean, look, if you look at the press reports of Labour over the last month or two, there's been a lot of talk about who's up and who's down in his shadow cabinet. Talk of Keir Partstarmer's first year, talk of the Red Wall, but very little attempt to rethink what the party's actually for, its essential purpose and character. Despite losing uh, four elections in 11 years, and we still face a mountain climb to get anywhere close to winning next time. So that's what I sort of try and jump into in the book and go to sort of fundamental questions to say, suggest that Labour should rethink its purpose around the question of human dignity as we emerge out of the pandemic, specifically the dignity of Labour. Now, you might think, well, that's what Labour's all about, the dignity of Labour. I would say over the last 20 years, on both the Blairite side and the Corbynite side, it's lost its way, partly because it's, it's become too attached to ideas that the working class are disappearing through automation and technological change. And literally, the working class have been written out of the script. And funnily enough, when you sell that to people, they appear less to be in support of you and vote for you. So any renewal for me must be re about rebuilding a politics of work around Labour. Right. Actually, interesting, Joe Biden's put unions at the heart of his recovery plan and attempt to create 18 million new jobs. And he literally said a couple of days ago that jobs that you can raise a family on and ensure fair and fair choice to organise and bargain collectively. So that's... That's what the book is about, to try and go to the fundamentals about the character of Labour and its future direction and the mistakes we've made over the last couple of decades, because we need to have a full reckoning. Now, that's not going to come before May the 6th when the elections uh, results come out, but it's something we need to really dwell on in the months that lie ahead. Uh, viewers can see the front cover of your book. You've mentioned it a couple of times, The Dignity of Labour. Um, Danny, do you want to pick up on some of the issues raised there by John? Because you wrote earlier this month that Labour should let Starmer, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, be Starmer, that he's a middle-class London lawyer and he should be trying to attract like-minded voters. Uh, what do you think of John's strategy? Well, first of all, you know, those are, those were not attacks. You know, I'm also a middle class professional living in, uh, you know, the north of or to the north of London. So I, I don't, don't regard those as attacks. It's just a, mm -mm. trying to work out who Keir Starmer is. And I don't think he's the man for the dignity of Labour. John is asking the right questions. What is the Labour Party for? And he's providing a perfectly tenable answer. Uh, it's for something else other than what it's actually doing or being or has become. Uh, because the Labour Party has become the par a party of graduates. Um, it's lost its base in the, in the North. It's lost its base in Scotland. And it has got a potential appeal to other Liberal voters, which it doesn't reach out to. Now, one option, of course, is to go back and try and get those base votes um, back with a completely different type of appeal and with, by the way, a different leader. Uh, and the other is to go forward and turn the Labour Party into what it's become over a long period, which is a kind of internationalist Liberal Party. And that is what Keir Starmer can do. Right. Um, but what he's doing at the moment is falling between the, that strategy and John's. And it doesn't work to fall between two strategies like that. I'm going to bring in the other guests, but I just want to get John's response to that. I, I agree with a, an awful lot of what Danny's just said. I mean, my fear is that Labour is becoming an increasingly dominated by uh, a meritocratic elite, by which I mean pulling some 74% of our membership from the professional middle classes, especially from London and the South East, increasingly pulling our vote share from social classes A, B, C, 1, and a declining support amongst the working class. I think the present latest YouGov figures have a Tory 25% poll lead amongst the working classes. Now, Political parties aren't there just to chase votes. 
They are born out of traditions, histories, theories of justice, and they have to respect them. And I fear that we are becoming something that we are not. And um, I think we should um, recorrect before it's too late, right. because I also think we can be encamped in urban environments or university towns, mm. and we will never win if we shrink the sort of gene pool into that sort of voting profile. Um, now, I know Danny wants us to go that way because that would guarantee enduring conservative government, irrespective of the latest bout of sleaze. But I think for the only way for Labour to recover is to one that sort of rethinks its fundamental okay. purpose consistent with its own history and traditions yes. and actually it's a very contemporary agenda when you see for example British gas workers sacked for refusing to accept a, a worse contract just yesterday oh. Tesco's network rail trying to do the same yeah. okay. deliver room drivers who were earning two pound an hour on a shift when Let the chief executive stands to make 500 million on a float today All right, so well, these look, are I'm, quite contemporary issues I think I'm going to bring in the others uh, Dan you can hold that thought that was put to you about why you uh, you think that's a good strategy because because, Lorna, Green parties are often successful and often caught liberal, city-based voters. Is that the right way to go for parties on the left? Well, you've got a problem in the Westminster system anyway with the sort of two-party system and the first-past-the-post voting. Right away, you've got a problem there. It forces Labour to be a much broader church than is actually comfortable. That There are people in the Labour Party that are forced together by the political system that actually don't align very well at all. You know, Keir Starmer on one end of it and the workers that uh, John was just describing on the other end of it, you know, delivery drivers and stuff. They are not natural political bedfellows. And it's so disappointing to me that Labour would rather have Tory governments time after time after time than commit to electoral reform that would mean that more people would have a say. And yes, you might have to have coalition governments and you might have to have minority governments that involve negotiation and consensus building instead of just always trying to get a majority. You know, you'd have governments more like what we have in Scotland, where we have more progressive politics because we have more progressive parties because we have proportional voting. And that's something Labour is just going to have to let go of. As long as they commit to this two-party system, as long as you have unelected lords, you cannot really claim that the UK is a properly democratic country. And so the people, the workers, will never have a proper voice. Right. Well, Claire, how do you think Labour wins back the sorts of people that John's talking about? Um, actually, I agree with Laura on the unelected Lords point. Uh, I say that with full knowledge that, that I'm one of them. Um, I, so John is asking the right questions, but I don't think it works to just sit as a demographic question. I mean, there's always been uh, middle class professionals in the Labour Party in all the different political parties. So what? But it's what politics they're embracing. And I think one of John's the contribution of the book, as I've understood from his interviews, is that he's also understood that the Labour Party had an intellectual life. It actually had a set of ideas, people who worked very hard at working out what the Labour Party was for. And at the moment, that is actually not part of its tradition at all. It's rejected that intellectual tradition. It hasn't created a new one, as far as I can see. And it veers unhelpfully between embracing identity politics, which I think has been an utterly divisive and disastrous route for it to go down, the competition between victimhoods, all of the problems that are associated with seeing people through the colour of their skin, the whole mess around trans rights versus women's rights that's really eaten up parts of the Labour Party. It's got that on the one side, and on the other side, its attitude to ordinary people is to kind of in a kind of a Victorian, a kind of technocratic Victorian largesse to the very poor. When I talk to Labour Party members, they actually think the working class are kind of poor and impoverished rather than, as John says, the dignity of Labour, working class people who are struggling, like those gas workers, mm. but they're not to be patronised or looked after. And the contemporary Labour Party has shown nothing, I'm afraid, right. but contempt very often for working class communities and their traditions and their attitudes, Brexit being the most recent example, which the Tories benefited from. But when, you know, think about what Labour Party said, that they're all racists, right? That they've got backward ideas, mm. that, you know, anyone who voted uh, to leave the EU was a type. I'm, I'm only saying that because that is the profound crisis of the Labour Party. Well, let's put, the, and... let's put, well, let's put some of that back to, back to John. I mean, is Keir Starmer the right person to win back those traditional Labour voters, John? 
Well, I mean, the jury's out. Um, we'll see in terms of the immediate elections. But once this pandemic's out of the way, we, we, I think he has to find a voice because it's been very difficult when, when he's sort of trapped in a sort of virtual conversation with people. What I would say, I mean, the book is about human dignity and Keir Starmer gained an international reputation as an advocate on behalf of human dignity when he challenged the death penalty and gained a reputation on the basis of those... Right. Um, human ideals and therefore he is someone who I think has it in him to speak to these fundamental questions of human dignity and the dignity of labour and he's done it in previous careers. Right, so, inhabit, so I, inhabit, I'm very supportive of what in, in, he can do. Right, so inhabiting his, his former life as a lawyer in the way Danny was saying, be who he is. Yes, I do. I think he should speak to, he should find his voice and I think he can do it by well, right. excavating his previous career and some of the okay. thinking that he invested in terms of the, right. the passions but, that but, he advocates. OK, but John, people may be saying, what does this look like on a manifesto? You know, what does this look like when you're trying to win an election? Because interesting right. um, and poignant all this is, how do you turn those big ideas of dignity and the precariousness right. of work into straightforward policies? Well, in the book, there are scores of policies in terms of building good work, new national colleges for our vocations and skilled work, special covenant for key workers, a new definition of workers so that we can protect the gig economy workers, a new pandemic reconstruction fund. But also, there's also a lot of talk about um, FDR's New Deal from the 30s. I'm more interested in Roosevelt's 1944 State of the Union, where he argued for a, an economic bill of rights to guarantee access to decent housing, right. a right to useful and remunerative work, okay. um, access to education, social security and health as a constitutional right for all citizens. That is a powerful message and a, fun, a fundamental yes. rethink about and is, the purpose And is Keir Starmer listening to you on that? Uh, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to say that he's listening to me, no, but I think there is a debate to be had and I think he would welcome that debate. Right. I mean, Danny, the Conservatives took many voters uh, from Labour in 2019. Have they now gone, those voters? I mean, are, are, are they different in that sense? Well, no. Um, so, first of all, Keir Starmer could easily end up becoming Prime Minister on a Time for a Change manif uh, manifesto. Secondly, I, I didn't completely agree with Claire that Labour has gone fully down the route of identity politics. I think that's unfair on Labour. Or maybe it's too fair because they haven't actually picked sufficiently to have done uh, something like that. They haven't gone down a full liberal route or fully down the route that John suggests. Um, Obviously, you've got to build a broad coalition. The question is, what do you regard your base as being? John is sure that the base of the Labour Party remains um, working class, traditional Labour voters. I do understand that strategy. Um, I don't think Keir Starmer can deliver that particular strategy because that's not who he is. Keir Starmer can only be authentically Keir Starmer. He cannot be authentically John Crudus or authentically Len McCluskey. He has to be himself. Uh, and if he's going to be himself, he's going to appeal to a different voter. He should do that wholeheartedly. And I know that John cynically thinks that it's just because I want the Tories to win. I, I, you know, I, I'm giving this advice because I think it's the right advice. Um, and if Labour doesn't take it, and I suspect they won't, that'll be what helps the Conservative Party. All right, something for John for you to mull over uh, there. We're going to leave it and move on because the Scottish Greens want to incorporate the right to food in Scots law. It's set out in the UN International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Lorna, what does that actually mean, having the right to food enshrined in law? Well, it's really interesting. I thought John's comment just there on what he thinks should be enshrined in the Constitution. And it's something that I, I find, and young people in Scotland particularly find interesting about the idea of Scottish independence, is that we would be at the birth of a new nation. And something that we could do is have, well, that we should do and will do is have a written constitution. And historically, when countries have had the opportunity to sit down and write yeah. what rights are going to enshrine in their constitution, um, they, you know, they do freedom of, uh, religion and voting mm. and so on. But there's no reason at all we shouldn't enshrine actual human rights in there, such as the right to food, mm. housing, remunerative work, and so on. Now, we're not yet at that point. We haven't yet won the independence referendum. So in the meantime, I think it is still worth enshrining human rights sure. to law. Right, but Laura, what I mean is, what would it mean in practice? Right um, to food. Yes, I, I understand what it means from a sort of constitutional legal perspective. But what would it mean in practice? What would it mean for families? Are you talking about increasing benefits in order to meet that human right that you would have enshrined in law? Or is it about food parcels being delivered to families in need uh, in perpetuity? What, what does it mean? 
Well, something, first of all, it would just be about the principle of that. And then you need to look at the way that can be implemented. And you're absolutely right. Benefits for the Scottish Greens, we would much rather people had money in their pockets that they can decide how they spend it on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, we Part of it is about how food comes to our tables and where people have the options to buy food, setting up of local food cooperatives, for example, meaning that people can share food that we're not having to go through big supermarket chains that create, you know, profit making enterprises that we look at it in a joined up way. Where is our food grown? How is it transported to the people who eat and so on? And you can set up these networks to make sure that everybody has you know, has the food that they need, nutritious food for every child. And things like, simple things like school meals, which we have in Scotland now. Right, well, we'll we'll perhaps come on to that example if we have time. But, Danny, actually, this is an idea that's also been talked about in some Conservative circles uh, because uh, the Tory MP, Neil Parrish, um, it will report he's part of the committee, Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, agrees that that it should be uh, considered enshrining in law a right to food. If you enshrine a right law what it means is that courts rule on what the right means so you were asking Lorna what it meant but it doesn't actually be for her to define it ultimately that will end up being defined by the courts um and you have to decide whether you think that's a good idea because it legalizes a lot of politics and therefore yeah. some of the ideas that she puts down will not be the ideas the courts have um but uh, the the broader point which is uh, whether food poverty is now an increasingly severe and clear problem and the figures say is. it is yep it obviously is and i think that um a concerted effort to ensure that it isn't the problem you know that this problem isn't allowed to persist and you know one of the things would be to make uh, permanent the change that have been made has been made in the school meals uh policy during the holidays that's yes. but that's only one measure that is the right thing to do definitely but i'm not in favor I, I, I enshrining abstract political rights that lorna can then describe vaguely what they would stand for which turn out to be coincidentally what she thinks would be a good idea that's not how i think we should proceed with politics that's a constitutional uh, question rather than about food okay claire your response to the idea in principle and perhaps in practice and while you're talking we're just going to be showing pictures of food banks because there has been a significant rise in the use of food banks over the course of pandemic um, a rise of 88 percent of independent food banks over the period uh, from february to october 2020 so i, I i'm really opposed to the use of legislation and the law in this way it actually feels like a lowest common denominator rather than an inspiring vision you know the idea that people have the right to food well i should bloody well hope so that's what one would say i kind of get nervous as well that you know john's points about the dignity of work i mean what i want is for people to have the dignity of autonomy of their own agency to be able to decide on their lives and have enough money so that they can survive and have food and choose whatever food they want Mm. and not actually a green version of where you buy the right food from. So, uh, you know, there is food poverty, but what there is is poverty. And when we talk about the pandemic, you know, this wasn't an act of God. Decisions were taken, policies were made, people have been impoverished. It's not a food problem. It's not a law problem. Right, let me get John's uh, response because we've only got a minute or so. Okay, well, well, briefly, I'm I'm really inspired by the idea. Actually, I think Lorna's idea is a great idea because a series of economic rights, as to rethink citizenship, is a statement of what we think a just society should provide, and um, it 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 is it, it is a statement of intent which calls politicians out to deliver on it. So I think it, it's a sign of rethinking the community that we can be in the future as we come out of this pandemic because we can't just go back to where we were. Right. Well, Lorna, you've got the support of John there. Um, what did you think and respond to the others, Danny and Claire, in terms of your idea? Well, I think that we absolutely need to enshrine the right to food. You know, it, in doing it in legislation, as John says, does set out an intention. And then it would be for political parties, knowing that this was the law, to put forward their policies and proposals. And I can see that a Conservative Party would put forward different proposals. But the truth is, Work doesn't pay. We've made work so precarious. The minimum wage is a poverty wage that people can't feed themselves and we okay. have to do better than this. All right, we're going to end it there. Thank you to all of my guests for a fascinating programme. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back on Monday, as will I, at 12.15. From all of us here, bye-bye. <laughs>